Muslims believe that from the very beginning, the great Arab conquests were all about Islam. But in the seventh century, you can barely find a new religion called Islam anywhere in the historical record. This is Jerusalem. They've been building walls here for a long time. Here, if anywhere, in the one-time world of the Roman Empire, the 6th and 7th centuries live on. The same intensities, the same anxieties. For thousands of years, Jerusalem had been shaped and mapped by the religions of its rulers. When the Jews ruled, they built a gigantic temple which dominated the city. Later, when the Roman Empire became Christian, Jerusalem was transformed into the world center of Christian pilgrimage. Look at the street plan now, and you saw a map of a Christian world. The Jews were gone, airbrushed out of the picture. The Romans constructed a new holy of holies, the Holy Sepulchre, a vast cathedral raised over the traditionally accepted site of Jesus's crucifixion. That was how God and empire worked. The Roman Empire believed in God, and God believed in the Roman Empire. But then, in the year 636, God changed his mind. Arab marauders appear outside the walls. Sophronius, the city's bishop, writes that it is too dangerous to leave. The Arabs were closing in, and there was nothing people of Christian Jerusalem could do about it except to stay where they were, look out from their walls, and await the arrival of the Arabs. And out of the desert they came, and they had become irresistible. In 636, they beat a Roman army at Yarmouk. Soon after, they beat a Persian army at Cadesia. Both empires too weak after their own long wars to resist the Arabs. They marched into the richest provinces of the defeated empires. And less than five years after the death of Muhammad, they set their eyes upon the promised land. The land flowing with milk and honey, the land that God had promised to the Jews. Now, the Arabs had come to claim that birthright for themselves. The children of Israel had made it a Jewish land. The Romans had made it a Christian, holy land. If the Arabs did arrive with a new religion, then we should be able to find its imprint here. Contemporary Christian sources confirm that late in the 630s, the Arabs took over Jerusalem by peaceful negotiation. But what they don't say is what the conqueror's religion was. The truth of the matter is we don't know what was the true religion of the first Arab conquerors. We have a problem because this group of people from Arabia is tiny and they're ruling over 
much larger populations who are very well versed theologically uh, you know, of Christians and Jews and Zoroastrians who have very sophisticated religious ideas. Why would these populations not have risen up in rebellion against their Muslim rulers uh, if these Muslim rulers are trying to impose something totally different that was hostile to their own beliefs? What were the Arabs up to? What were their motives? We know they called themselves believers, but believers in what? Certain Christian contemporaries tell us that the Arabs believed in a single God and that they followed a guide or instructor. But in general, their understanding of what the Arabs believed was deeply confused. Was it a form of Judaism or some kind of Christianity? Or did they have a whole new religion of their own? For the Jews, as well as for the Christians. These are people coming from the desert. They don't know who these people are. They don't really know what they believe. They hear things. But perhaps there was a clue. At first, the new Arab rulers seemed closer to the Jews. They weren't interested in the Christian holy places. Instead, they began praying on the ruins of the old Jewish temple. All this only added to the Christian sense of paranoia. Behind the invasion of the Arabs, they began to suspect a Jewish conspiracy. It's the moment the Arabs took over Jerusalem, they headed straight up here to what then as now is a broad, open, man-made esplanade. The holiest place to Jews anywhere in the world. So the fact that the Arab conquerors came up here and started building a prayer hall on such a sensitive spot inevitably served to raise quite a few eyebrows. The Jews hope that these Arabs from the desert come as liberators. They permitted the Jews to come back to the Temple Mount and pray there. And the Jews started believing uh, that maybe uh, there is something messianic in these people and maybe their leader is the messiah who will permit them to rebuild the temple. Christian theologians who speak about the Arab conquerors find it very hard to understand that they are dealing with a new religion. Who are they? One thing is absolutely clear. Nobody had any notion that the Arabs were doing what they were doing in the name of a freshly minted and coherent new religion, still less that what they were doing was in the name of something called Islam. So did Islam even exist in those early years after Muhammad? In Jerusalem, 30 years after the conquest, it was business as usual. There were Christian pilgrims in the streets. The churches were full. Ancient religions were practicing their ancient rites. But where was the prophet in all this? 30 years after the death of Muhammad, here in Jerusalem, an Arab warlord called Muawiyah was hailed as leader of the new Arab empire. But if Muawiyah was a Muslim, then he showed precious little sign of it. The astonishing thing is that nowhere, not on his inscriptions, not on his coins, not on any of his documents, is there so much as a single mention of Muhammad. Mecca. The holiest city in Islam. The birthplace of Muhammad. This is the largest mosque in the world. At its center, the Kaaba, the house of God. Mecca 
is where Muslims believe everything began. The crossroads of faith and history. Surely here then, you would think, we could find solid evidence for Islam's beginnings. But there is a problem. Aside from a single ambiguous mention in the Quran itself, there is no mention of Mecca, not one, in any datable text for over a hundred years after Muhammad's death. How can we know that, that Muhammad does come from Mecca? We can't. But on the other hand, if he doesn't come from there, you have to come up with an, a plausible alternative for where he might have come from. And why would you want to take that on? Why would they get on? Well, you know, it's what historians do. If things don't fit, you try something else that might fit. In the Quran, the faithful are instructed to pray in the direction of a holy sanctuary. But what it doesn't ever say is that this sanctuary stood at Mecca. And to some archaeologists, a few early mosques suggest something different. We're talking about one of the earliest examples we have of a mosque. And you date 100 years after Muhammad? Somewhere within 100 years or so. Because here, as we go into it, you can see. This is it. This is it, yeah. This is the mosque. This is the mosque. And what it's, you can... It's... What, <laughs> what you can see here, we have an apse which is not facing Mecca. It's not facing the south. It's actually facing towards the east, towards the sun rising. This is an example of the time before the direction had actually been preferred towards Mecca. So the implication of that is that, that at this early stage, of Islam, the focus of prayer has not yet been absolutely fixed. The direction of prayer had not been well established yet. And so it's, it's, it's a bit like Islam. the concrete hasn't yet said. It's yeah. there, you can still play with it, you can still fiddle around with it, you can experiment Very with it. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Not a decisive clue, perhaps. But it is suggestive that even though there are no Muslim sources, there are reports from Christian writers of the time that the Arab conquerors bowed their heads in prayer not in the direction of Mecca, but in a quite different direction, somewhere further north. In the Quran, it never actually states that Muhammad lived in Mecca, nor that Mecca was where the first revelations took place. Does the material in the Quran point to Mecca being the setting for God's revelations to Muhammad? No, it doesn't. I mean, there is mention of a sanctuary. There is a sanctuary, for sure. Oh, but where is that sanctuary? That's, of course, you, we can't tell. It's devilishly difficult to sort of extract what the context might have been from the text itself. In Muslim tradition, the people of Mecca are pagans, worshippers of idols. But in fact, the people the Quran describes have a deep and sophisticated knowledge of the biblical tradition. The Quran retells biblical stories and alludes to biblical stories, not just biblical, but also post-biblical developments. All this is clearly known to the audience. It suggests that what we have is a kind of response on the part of, let us say, Muhammad to the debates that were going on in Christian and Jewish communities, where they were debating theological issues and questions uh, that come out of the Hebrew Bible and come out of the New Testament. And the Quran seems to be an effort to engage in the discussion. And so there's a strong connection with the late antique religious discourses that were alive throughout the Near East. 
So it's obviously not a pagan world we're looking for. The people in the Quran worship a single god, but it then accuses them of praying to beings other than God. And there's something else. The people the Prophet addresses in the Quran are farmers, agriculturalists. But there was no agriculture in Mecca. Mecca does not have an agrarian base. In Mecca, it seems to have been quite an arid valley. If Mecca is this barren, infertile place, how is it that in the Quran, the opponents of the Prophet are described as keeping cattle and growing olives and vines? Mm, good question. Um, this is one of the reasons why some scholars feel that the text of the Quran is really plugged into, say, Syria. Because that's where we, vines and olives yeah, grow you would find much further in north. Geographical Syria, where you don't find <clears throat> olive trees in Mecca. So if Mecca wasn't the starting point of Islam, what was? If you're following the clues in the Quran itself, then you're looking for a landscape inhabited by olive-growing Arabs who have a deep knowledge of the biblical tradition, but whose worship of a single god might seem to some a little shop-soiled. This is the city of Avdat, in the Negev desert. Back in the early 7th century, it was an Arab city on the very fringes of the Roman Empire. Nominally Christian, but with hints of a recently pagan past. It also had agriculture and olives. In the lifetime of Muhammad, all this would have been green. It would have been agricultural fields as far as the eye can see. Archaeology leaves no doubt that there was a sophisticated irrigation system here that really did make the desert bloom. And so while that doesn't mean that this Avdat is the actual spot where the Quran was composed, it does imply, I think, that the region as a whole seems to fit the wider context of the Quran better than somewhere much further south. In 1972, during the restoration of the Great Mosque of Sana, capital of North Yemen, workers discovered a mash of old parchments in a loft between the inner and outer roofs. The entire load was stuffed into some 20 potato sacks where it might have remained were it not for the arrival seven years later of Dr. Gerd Puin, a German scholar and Quranic expert. Puin immediately grasped the significance of the find. Working with a team of local assistants, he carefully prized the layers apart and fired off thousands of photographs. Four fragments immediately caught Puin's attention. They contained the first and last chapters of the Quran, and unlike any other Qurans in existence, they were illustrated with architectural drawings of mosques. A vital clue to their origin. Because of its drawings, because of the art historical context, you can date this Quran very precisely to the time of Al-Walid. This is the reign between 705 and 715. The oldest datable Quran in the world, created some 70 years after the death of the Prophet. From the potato sacks, Puyin identified fragments from nearly a thousand different Qurans. Comparisons between them and the standard Cairo text in use today are startling. These early texts are written in a kind of shorthand with no vowel markings or distinguishing dots, which means that individual words can have up to 30 different meanings. There was another important discovery amongst the Sana fragments. The application of simple forensic techniques revealed earlier texts that had been washed off and overwritten. Although the hidden text revealed no contradictory meanings, words had been changed, verses and whole chapters rearranged. 
If his researches are correct, particularly on dating, it suggests, in fact, that the Quran was not a single product, a single entity that was fixed by 650, but actually developed much, much later, hence the uh, overlaying of texts or written materials. A book appeared written by an expert in early Semitic languages. It was so controversial that the author published under a pseudonym and will only speak on condition that his identity remains concealed. So gesehen ist es unbedingt erforderlich, den Koran neu zu lesen. In order to understand it correctly, we need a fundamentally new interpretation and reading of the Koran. Dr. Markus Gross helped to translate the book from its original German into English and is willing, openly, to express the author's views. Es wurde schon gesagt, 20 percent ich würde sagen, 25 percent About a quarter or a fifth of the Quran contains unintelligible words or words which don't make real sense. That number can be vastly reduced with the knowledge of Syriac to, let's say, 5%. Syriac, or Syrio-Aramaic, had become one of the dominant languages of Christian liturgy by the 3rd century. Christ spoke Aramaic, and it can still be heard in remote Christian communities like this town of Malula in Syria. But at the time of Muhammad, Syrio-Aramaic was the major written and cultural language of the whole region. Written Arabic was in its infancy. Wir haben bis zum Koran einige Inschriften. There are uh, pre-Islamic uh, inscriptions in Arabic, very short texts, but the first real book written in Arabic uh, is the Koran. But you're saying the Koran is written in two languages. Ja, ich würde sagen, in many areas in the world, languages mix constantly, all the time. Then, to make it understandable to a speaker of English, you have to go back about a thousand years. Imagine the Anglo-Saxon peasant talking to his master, who was a Norman and spoke a mixed language of French and an Anglo-Saxon, and you could only understand that mixed language with the knowledge of both. Muslim scholars of the past had the confidence to acknowledge foreign words in the Quran. In the 10th century, Al-Tabari, one of the most respected commentators, identified Hebrew, Latin, Greek, Persian, Abyssinian, and Syriac words. The difference, though, is that Luxembourg is claiming new meanings that have never been suggested before. How can one German professor challenge the collective judgment of more than a billion people, and on what basis? What method? Does he use? Ich bin natürlich bemüht, zunächst einmal eine arabische Lesung und eine arabische Whenever I try to find a solution for an unclear passage, the first step is to try to find an overlooked meaning of an Arabic word which is not used today but which can be found in old dictionaries, something that the commentators didn't consider. Only if that is not possible, I take into consideration the meaning of the root, the, of the corresponding root in Syriac or a possible misreading. Misreading in this case means that the undotted text was dotted wrongly. Then there's also the possibility that a Syriac letter was by mistake, written with, within an Arabic text. Using these methods, Luxembourg examines some of the most obscure passages of the Quran. After Mary has given birth to Jesus, in the Arabic Quran, the archangel says to her, Be not sad, your Lord has placed a little river beneath you. In Luxembourg's version, Be not sad, your Lord has made your delivery legitimate. And there are other highly contentious examples. God's command to a skeptic in Arabic, look at your food and drink, look at your ass, becomes look at your condition and look at your overall state. At the end of the world, the earth steps forward in Arabic. In Syriac, the earth splits open. Plausible to some, but do any of these changes affect the central precepts of Islam? Or is Luxembourg just adding a little poetic color here and there? Was uh, soziale Gepflogenheiten angeht, wie zum Beispiel 
That's it's certainly not key precepts like the existence of God or afterlife, which is challenged by my interpretation, but many everyday customs. One example is the, the veil. The Quranic verse adduced to prove their position talked about humur, which had to be beaten on the pockets. The sentence was a bit obscure. It's usually rendered that it means cover your head and your cleavage. And if you have a look at uh, the, the chador, the, the veil in uh, Iran, for example, that's exactly what is covered. Aramish, Gmar, and ich ein Gürtel. But with my Syriac interpretation of the verse, my translation is put your belt around your hips. And the belt was a sign of chastity, also especially used by monks. So that makes it much more meaningful. When you read through and through the Quran, what's really striking as compared, say, to the Bible? which is full of allusions to recognizable landscapes that we know. In the Quran, it's an effort to find an allusion to any landscape or natural setting that we could actually pin down. In fact, in the whole of the Quran, there's really only the one exception. Not far from Avdat. A strange hint about where the Quran might actually have come from. We are on the southernmost shores of the Dead Sea, between what is now Israel and Jordan. Lot was the nephew of Abraham, and he went to settle down in a city called Sodom. And the people of Sodom were notoriously racy. Unsurprisingly, this provoked the wrath of God. He destroyed his city, and this is said to be the remains of Sodom, where the anger of God was poured down upon it. And the Quran. So also was Lot among those sent by us. Behold, we delivered him and his adherents, all except an old woman who was among those who lagged behind. Then we destroyed the rest. Truly, you pass by their sights by day and by night. But if the people being addressed by the prophet are passing this place by day and by night, then what's it doing here? A thousand kilometers from Mecca. Any of these, what, what, what's, 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 what's the first coin that actually mentions the name of, here? of, of the prophet Muhammad on the coins? Do any of these coins mention Muhammad by name? It was with uh, Muawiyah. Yeah, but is the, is the name of, is the, is the, name of the no. Prophet Muhammad no. mentioned? No, no, no. Every coin tells a story. Every inscription conveys an idea of power. Hey, hey, hey. But sometimes what's not on the coin can be just as significant as what is. It would, it would be nice to see the, the earliest yeah. coin that mentions Muhammad. The earliest uh, coin that has Muhammad's name. Has the name of Muhammad. They don't have it, but... Because it's, it's just, it's odd that we're 60 years on from the death of Muhammad and no mention of Muhammad. For nearly 60 years, the rulers of the Arab Empire didn't put Muhammad on their coins. And then they did. Maybe 60 years was what they needed to work out what the story really was. Maybe the issue isn't why Muhammad was not on the coinage at the beginning, but how he got there in the end. What if it wasn't Islam that gave birth to the Arab Empire, but the Arab Empire that gave birth to Islam? The empire was rich beyond imagining. By the mid-680s, it stretched from northern Persia to Egypt and North Africa. But who had the right to rule it? A vital question on which the Arabs could not agree. And with so much to play for, they began to turn upon themselves. It's 680. 50 years on from the death of Muhammad, a deadly spiral of rebellion and civil war is threatening the Arab Empire with implosion. 
and from deep within the Arabian desert, a new claimant to the empire emerges. His name, Abdullah ibn al-Zubayr. And ibn al-Zubayr is going to change the game. What I've got here is the coin that I was looking for in the coin museum, and it's stamped quite literally with the genius of Ibn el Zabaya. It was struck in 685, 686, so that's more than half a century after the death of Muhammad. And it bears a novel and fateful slogan, in the name of God, Muhammad is the prophet of God. And so here, at last, emerging from out of the black hole, we get a mention of a Muhammad who is a prophet. And this is the first time we have it on any inscription, any surviving document. Ibn al zubayr had essentially realized what Constantine, the first Christian Roman emperor, had realized long before him, that it was no good the lord of an earthly empire laying claim to the favor of God unless he could absolutely demonstrate the cast iron basis on which he was making that claim. And Constantine, in his attempt to obtain that sanction, had turned to the Christian church. But Ibn al zubayr turns to the figure of Muhammad. Now, as it happens, Ibn al zubayr loses the civil war. He is defeated by a rival warlord who lays claim to the empire of the Arabs. But the discovery that the name of Muhammad can be used to buttress earthly power, that is not forgotten. The Romans had known all about religion and power. When they had become Christian, they had redrawn the map of Jerusalem. Now, Abdul Malik set about fashioning a holy city of his own. God, it's beautiful. The Dome of the Rock. It's the oldest Islamic building in existence. In design, it was Roman. And Abdul Malik was doing something else that was Roman, plugging his dominion into the power of God. On the walls, there is an unequivocal mission statement. Religion, in the eyes of God, is Islam. There are mentions of Muhammad, quotations from the Quran. At last, something that we can recognize unmistakably as a new religion. There's a sense here of something new coming into being. There's the sense of the old, the Roman-style pillars and, and the mosaics. And yet, this is clearly not Roman, this is clearly not Christian. This is the beginning of something very, very potent, a harbinger of a spectacular future. It's certainly a very grand statement that we Muslims have superseded you Jews. And we have superseded you Christians by being filled with inscriptions uh, directed against Christian Trinitarian beliefs. So it's, uh, it, it's Muslims saying, uh, we are here, we've come to stay, and we are the winners. Abdul Malik now rules his empire as the deputy of God, just as the Christian Roman emperors had done. And like the Roman emperors, he has built a house of God in Jerusalem. But Abdul Malik, Lord of Jerusalem though he is, is also an Arab. Perhaps for Arabs, Jerusalem, for all its ancient and unrivaled potency, owed too much to the Jews and Christians to stand alone as the holy city of the new Arab empire. A poet at Abdul Malik's court describes him as the lord of two houses sacred to God, one in Jerusalem and one, well, he doesn't say where it is. And for 100 years after the death of Muhammad, no one says where it is.
all sources go on calling it a place in the desert. It's a sanctuary in the desert, without giving it a name. And at some point, this sanctuary must have been fixed at Mecca, in the middle of the desert. But why? The truth of the matter is we don't know what was the true religion of the first Arab conquerors. It's an Arab story. Arabs come from the desert. God is speaking to the Arabs. There is no room for anyone else. It's remote. It's remote. It's uncontaminated. It's pure. It's a place where we can rule out that Muhammad got his ideas from others than God. You begin by looking in the record, and all you find is emptiness. And you end up in the desert, and all you see is emptiness. But perhaps the emptiness is the answer. Maybe Mecca gave Islam what it most needed, a blank sheet where Muslims could put their prophet beyond the reach of history.